I'm Colin Wolfe, Assistant Director of Religious Education at the Fourth Universalist Society in the City of New York. What you're about to see is a recording of a live presentation on Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy and its relationship to theology. This is part of our Pop Culture and Theology series. I hope you enjoy. Right, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. I am Colin Wolf, Assistant Director of Religious Education. This is our online series, Pop Culture and Theology. Each month, we try to center a new popular franchise or trend and discuss its religious implications and connections. <clears throat> We're still experimenting with the format a bit. This is our third go at it. And our sessions have ranged from about 45 minutes to closer to 90 minutes total. Today, I'll be going a little more towards that latter end of the range we've established with three books and a lot of ideas to cover. Um, but we have the link till 8.30. And after the presentation, I'll gladly take questions from anyone still here or still standing. And if you uh, need to log off before the end, I will not be offended at all and would be delighted to field questions or comments by email if we don't get to yours this evening. So again, this event is being recorded. I go ahead and make sure that you are muted. And if you like, I'm only recording my screen, but you can hide your camera if you prefer. And when we transition to the open questions portion, uh, we'll probably mostly use the chat box, but depending on the size of the group, we, we may open it up to more, uh, more live out loud discussion. Uh, I wanna briefly thank uh, John Howe for the illustration we used as our uh, centerpiece in the event cover art and our promotional materials. That was for the third book, The Amber Spyglass. Uh, as I understand it, it was never actually selected for a printed edition of his dark materials, but many of you will be familiar with Howe's renderings of Tolkien's Middle Earth, some of which along with the works of Alan Lee were used in designing the movie adaptations. And also thanks to John Lawrence for the smaller cover art icons for the bottom edge of that graphic we sent out uh, used for the 20th anniversary edition of the series. Um, showing the three objects around which uh, each book in the series is built. And the slide you saw just now when you logged on, uh, the one with the armored bear is from the recent HBO BBC collaborated television miniseries adaptation of the books. <clears throat> so this month, I am honored and excited to get to discuss Sir Philip Pullman's excellent His Dark Materials series, uh, usually classed as a fantasy series, uh, and less often science fiction, it might better be described as Miltonian, Blakean, metaphysical fiction. It is most popularly associated with the title, The Golden Compass in the United States. It's the American title for the first book known as Northern Lights in England. We'll talk about that difference a little bit later. Sir Philip Pullman was knighted in 2019 for services to literature. The second season of the second adaptation attempt of his dark materials for the screen finished airing in December on HBO and Sir Philip Pullman is in the process of writing the final installment of a follow up trilogy in the same world, though I use the word with hesitation you'll see why a trilogy exploring events both before and after this one his dark materials. So the series is receiving renewed attention, uh, though since its first publication it has never really been dormant for many of its appreciators myself included. There are also a few very short works, side stories, interstitial tales involving this world that are enjoyable, but not crucial to understanding the series. So the three installments of the original trilogy, which we're focusing on tonight, were published in 1995, The Northern Lights, 1997, the sequel, The Subtle Knife, and concluding with The Amber Spyglass in 2000, winning Pullman in 2001, the prestigious Whitbread Award, now called the Costa Award, the first so-called children's or young adult book to do so, though Pullman takes exception to that designation has actually been quite an outspoken critic of a separated young adult category, thinking that this artificially steers young readers to material designed to cater to a kind of patronizing assumption of what they're capable of understanding or finding interesting rather than expanding their minds and challenging them to guide their own literary explorations. And I tend to agree with him for the most part. So I, I read it quite young and reread it, at, I reread it at intervals as I get older. Uh, for me, it only appreciates in richness and effect. 
Uh, you might also know this series for the controversy it stirred up. The 2007 effort to adapt it to the big screen with New Line Cinema was met with very fierce resistance from uh, religious groups, including the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights, arguing uh, not wholly without grounds, but uh, in exactly the uh, dogmatic tones Pullman was criticizing uh, that this was atheism for kids. This combined with a movie runtime not nearly su sufficient to capture the first book, despite an excellent cast, uh, tanked its chances for sequels, sadly. But why, why the religious pushback? Uh, Pullman is, yes, an outspoken atheist, is often uh, rather too narrowly regarded, uh, though partly from criticisms Pullman himself has made of the Narnia Chronicles as the sort of anti-C.S. Lewis. Uh, he has some uh, rancorous but not entirely unfair things to say about a number of the popular juggernaut fantasy series out there, including the works of Tolkien, which he describes as not being at all psychologically compelling, lacking, as does Harry Potter, in his view, a serious engagement with the role of sexuality in human maturation and connection. So his series quickly, though incompletely, became understood partly through Pullman's own provocative comments and partly through the aforementioned religiously motivated defamation campaign as being about its protagonists killing God. Uh, we'll discuss why this is a, a less than comprehensive take on the series, but there's no question his Dark Materials does not take a favorable view of organized religion. And though the promoters of its film and TV adaptations have tried to deflect as to its really being about religion, as opposed to say some uh, broader, more interchangeable and anodyne theme like uh, authoritarianism, this is also a kind of misleading reading, uh, though one can appreciate its utility on the press circuit, and it does actually connect us to a series motif, uh, iconography and figurative meaning, the extent to which the peculiarities of an object representing other valences of meaning holds precedence, or uh, are, if it's merely extension of or absorbed in the more superordinate categories for which it stands. Uh, I do not think the focus on religion here can be neatly regarded as a superficial stand-in for uh, anti-authoritarianism in all its expressions, though. But there is, in addition to this, a, a great deal more to the series. It does not lack, but includes much more than a takedown of religion, um, a, a very much positive, uh, by which I mean active and forceful case for the power of the human imagination, um, the, the power of self-awareness, <clears throat> the acquisition of experience, and letting go of the nostalgic potency of the seeming uh, idol of youth and innocence. So to me, it is uh, just an, an exquisite work of consilience and synthesis. It incorporates a panoply of influences, literary, astrophysical, theological, biological, institutional. And the setting very much lends itself to this style. Uh, Pullman places us in a version of Oxford in a parallel world, one of uncountable multitudes uh, riffing on what in our world we know as the Everettian hypothesis, uh, that every time a juncture is encountered, one in which there appears to be a choice between actions or outcomes, there's a new pedigree of choices springing from each choice. And though any given world may go left, another may have gone right. And so the choices diverge and multiply exponentially from there. And the, the world to which Pullman first introduces us is close to ours, uh, the readers in many ways, but the differences start to become apparent to us as we go. So Pullman is able this way to draw on whatever real life sources interest him while still giving full license to creative development and interpretation. So uh, geographically, racially, linguistically, the world in which he first places us often overlaps with ours, or at least you can trace the connections. But this world also has a civilization of armored bears, which is things anyway perceived to be spirits. And then there's the device of which Pullman says he is proudest, rightly, I think. Everyone in this world has an animal familiar called a demon, spelled D-A-E-M-O-N, a metaphysical extension of their character and personality, sometimes described as their souls, walking alongside them, spirit animals, if you will. But the series takes an increasingly complicated and qualified look at how far these loaded terms like soul or spirit can really take us in understanding the nature of the demons. The idea of the spirit animal, of course, is not Pullman's creation, but it is the rules governing this particular vision of their relationship with the humans, of which they're an extension, that, that really stand out. Though a person in this world cannot separate far from their demon without tremendous pain and eventual death if it goes too far, though there are exceptions to this rule, uh, which Pullman explores, especially in the follow-up trilogy, The Book of Dust, which for purposes of time we'll not dig into too much today, especially since it isn't yet finished. And, as a, a, and a child's demon can change shape at will, but when they go through puberty and their sense of self and awareness settle, so do their demons, 
adult demons take on the animal shape most representative of who they really are. So unlike other fantastical personality indicators like Hogwarts house selection in which Dumbledore assures Harry Potter that choice is the operative element, whatever his inherited predispositions. In Pullman's world, mm -mm, a person cannot ultimately customize their demon and may end up discovering something about themselves when their demon settles that they would otherwise have preferred to deny. So this introduces a whole interesting conversation about the reliability and universality and layering of symbols, uh, which is a major theme throughout the series. Uh, Pullman taking a cue from the Gnostic gospels reinterprets, for instance, the serpent as uh, not representation of seducer deceiver, but into more of a, a Promethean role that of giver and preceptor. Uh, and yet Pullman's story still has examples of devious or facile characters whose demon is a snake. So it isn't so much that symbols can be rightly or wrongly gauged in universal terms, um, but rather they are, they are mutable, malleable, and they take on their meaning from the consciousness and culture that imbues them with it. Like language then, symbols are not entirely arbitrary, at least insofar as their meanings are reliably communicative within a given group or context. So their lack of intrinsic necessity does not mean they can't ever be instructive. So thus there, there's still an assumption in Pullman's demonology that the animal form adopted by a demon <clears throat> can be used with some consistency to read something into the personality of the human of which it is an extension. Many questions, not all of them answered, arise then about the degree to which the demons mechanistically reflect a cosmic truth of abstract associations or just highly localized and contingent human aesthetic biases, things the second trilogy two books in has started to tease a little bit more. But the inability for people to choose their demon's final form also complicates without quite contradicting this vehement case for human self-determination to which much of the series otherwise tends. So also in contrast to Harry Potter, uh, who finds out the nature of the prophecy centering on him by the end of book seven or book five out of seven, uh, it is imperative that Pullman's protagonist, Lyra, not know she is fulfilling her own prophecy. So an absence of information in this case conduces to the freedom of the choices she is given to make, that freedom being essential to their meaningfulness. Uh, this is not the usual atheistic angle to pair ignorance and freedom, but it would be wrong to say this correspondence with respect to Lyra and the prophecy amounts to a thesis for the series as a whole, rather this tension between unconscious but possibly deterministic natural law and free will, uh, choice and destiny, knowledge and ignorance, and the respective virtues, advantages, and dangers is with us throughout the series. So it's an exploration of the rigor that comes with confronting the boundaries of myth, reality, meaning, and choice. And the demons are our real key to exploring what becomes a wider story about the relationship between matter and consciousness, between physical beings and their own understanding of themselves. Demons can talk. They have personalities apparently distinct from their humans, but we don't entirely know how a human's inner life is compartmentalized by uh, and expressed in their demon. Uh, they're most commonly, but not always of a different sex from their human. Um, they're also more likely to interact with other demons rather than with a human to which they're not appended. And it's considered a grotesque deformity in Lyra's world to not have a demon, as well as a great and unforgivable violation to touch another person's demon without permission. So our story centers around this girl that I've been mentioning, Lyra, whose still shape-shifting demon is named Pantalaimon. Lyra is introduced to us as an orphan taken under the wing of the scholars at Jordan College, one of Oxford's colleges that does not exist in our world. Uh, she overhears, hiding, uh, perhaps winking, winkingly, perhaps not, in a wardrobe, a conversation between her uncle, Azriel, <clears throat> and a group of scholars, in which a mysterious elementary particle called dust is brought up. And this dust clearly is not the ordinary lowercase d dust, whatever it is. Uh, it appears to have more of an affinity for adults than children, and seems to have very much upset the established religious order, a sprawling theocratic institution called the Magisterium. So that's where we lay our scene in the here there of Lyra's Jordan, where she flouts authority and any and all attempts to educate her, gets into wild scrapes with the local children of manifold backgrounds and classes. So Pullman manages to create really quite wonderfully lived in personalities and textured relationships in a way that uh, quite spoiled me from most other fantasy literature, sadly, very sadly, because Fantasy was my first true love among book genres, which is not the case for Pullman, as we will discuss soon. <clears throat> 
So that's kind of the introductory segment. And before we go any further, uh, I, I very much want to encourage those who have not read the series to read it. I hope that primer I just gave will be enough to pique your interest. Um, if you have not read this series and maybe wish to and are especially spoiler averse, now is the time to make your escape. Uh, if you have a hard time acquiring the books in hard copy, I recommend the brilliantly produced audiobooks. They can be borrowed and downloaded directly from the New York Public Library online database for free on apps like Libby. Um, but I will somewhat assume a rough familiarity with the material going forward and uh, be warned, I, I will be talking about things that span the whole length of the trilogy. All right, so let's talk about this dust uh, that Lyra hears the scholars discussing. <clears throat> so what is dust? We begin uh, with a quote from one of Pullman's chief influences in the formation of his mythology, and that's Milton's Paradise Lost. Here's a quote from it <clears throat> that Pullman uses as a, an epigraph in the book. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature and perhaps her grave of neither sea nor shore nor air nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly and which thus must ever fight unless the almighty maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss, the wary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage for no narrow firth he had to cross. As Paradise Lost, book two. This quote is significant for a couple of reasons. One, you probably caught in there the title of the series we're talking about, His Dark Materials. Uh, in the quote, it's referring to what seems to be that pluripotent raw cosmic soup with which the creator, the maker, fashions worlds by designating the confused mix his dark materials, and thus orderly existence is derived from gravid chaos. However, Pullman will vigorously question the claims of this supposed maker as authority, who in our story, Pullman's story, is an imposter angel that has assumed credit for the holy natural creation. To the chief banished angel in Christian lore is, of course, Satan, whom we take to be the wary fiend also mentioned in the Milton passage. Pullman, however, somewhat valorizes the rebellion against the first supposed maker angel's imposture, much as Blake identified the devil as having a far greater claim to Milton's sympathies than the heavenly host did. In this series, the leader of the rebel angels, who first realized the authority so-called to have arrogated to himself his power and status, is named Zephania. She leads the rebellion. As Pullman sets it down, uh, in a brilliant stroke of vengeance for their banishment from the kingdom of heaven, the rebel angels intervened in human evolution by imparting to them the Promethean fire. Not fire, though. Here it is awareness, consciousness. Thus, the substitution of experience for innocence does not mark a, a wicked disobedience and first fall of man, but the moment when we were graced with our best means of manumitting ourselves from those parts of the cosmic order that willfully deny us our will. The serpent in the garden then is now a rescuer, an agent of a distinctly more virtuous mischief. So to mature, to understand, to, to complicate our impulses and senses with thought is a good thing. In fact, the greatest thing to which conscious life can aspire. Innocence isn't now in this scheme demoted to a wicked state either. We need to pass through it first to acquire the dynamic contrast that makes for memory and character and personhood. So this is really the crux of, of Pullman's mythology and uh, if a message can be admitted of uh, his message. So remember the child's shape-shifting animal demon settles to mark the passage into adulthood and how Pullman considers the serpent's more celebrated role as benefactor to humankind against false divinity in the Gnostic gospels. So uh, Pullman would distinguish his creative cosmology from those texts, however, by declaring his allegiance to and love of the physical world, without which we would not have a basis for connecting with or interpreting the best that life has to offer us. So I, as, uh, as someone who calls himself an imaginative natural secularist, find this a very thrilling assertion. The dark materials in question then in Pullman's reckoning are not the mere physical compounds with which the terrene plane is molded, but also something far more subtle and significant. The elementary particle from which consciousness itself is derived because it, the particle is conscious, is consciousness in essence. It's a particle that in Lyra's world goes by the common name of dust with a capital D. Uh, 
So as I also mentioned, the poetic mythology of William Blake had a great influence on Pullman's creation, uh, works such as Songs of Innocence and Experience, um, and the even more subversive Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, but Pullman has, in taking Blake's recommendation that we create our own systems rather than be bound to someone else's, uh, has also is also broken with Blake and Milton in some key respects. But this Blake quote offers a good starting place for both the term dust and its function in Pullman's literary universe. It's from Europe, a prophecy, when a fairy responding to the question, tell me what is the material world and is it dead? Assures the questioner, the fairy can show you all alive, the world where every particle of dust breathes forth its joy. So the essential feature of this dust particle is that it is the elementary, thus indivisible, unit of consciousness. Pullman's sensibility, both in this series and in what we might call his personal cosmic aesthetic, is that of panpsychism, or the notion that matter itself carries with it a conscious element, which can be heightened or complicated in aggregate, but that is present even in, as the Blake quote has it, every particle of dust. Some of the interpretations of, of this idea with which Pullman seems to have a, a non-committal flirtation in real life too, uh, are different from the system he develops in his dark materials, however. Uh, this dust with a capital D is what Pullman offers as the fundamental material component which induces the otherwise inert matter to which it is, as we will see, selectively drawn with consciousness. Uh, so in this series, matter is not innately conscious, but its deadness or awareness is determined by the presence of this particle, which is itself a variety of matter. It's all, it's all materials. So in an essay uh, from Pullman's fascinating and insightful collection, Demon Voices, he has this to say about how he regards the general idea of panpsychism. I don't argue this, I perceive it. That's what he says. In other interviews, he's expressed uh, an interesting relief that the mystery of consciousness and dark matter have not been wholly interpreted in scientific terms uh, by the time his dark materials was published. And I personally find this a little perplexing because the value of this idea of dust to me is not in its explanatory or, or real or predictive power in our world, um, that of the reader. Uh, in those cases where science fiction and fantasy writers like Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke have been said to anticipate certain discoveries or inventions, it seems a pleasant surprise, but it's not mainly why we turn to them. Um, and I think even based on what we know of consciousness as a property emerging from neural electric activity on a substrate of very complex organic networks, we can be fairly skeptical of the idea of innate, or in this case, externally animated or accessorized material consciousness already. But even if we should solve the mystery of consciousness in a way that excludes panpsychism entirely, the series would still hold value to me because as with all fantasy or science fiction, uh, as long as the book doesn't appear to be propagandistically advancing its internal peculiar magic system, which isn't to say philosophical underpinning on real life, we all instinctively control for a certain baseline adjustment from our reader's reality um, to the fantasy reality, which allows us to find creative fascination and inspiration in the non-real. Um, so as many believers, including Pullman and myself do this on occasion, uh, even with religious narratives. So, Pullman understands this relationship to the non-real and the value we can get from it very, very well and has written extensively and lucidly on it. So it's interesting to hear him sometimes describe the value of his fictional metaphysics in terms of its potential compatibility with real life scientific enterprise. Uh, he would probably at this point invoke intentional fallacy and recommend that I not try too hard to square his personal views with his creative productions. But this line of investigation does lead us back directly to his work, to something Pullman articulates both within and without it and which most scientists would agree with, which is that sometimes scientific progress does require a creative or imaginative or dare I say speculative element, which can actually help frame testable inquiry or help us bridge the gaps between our, our limited empirical experience, our very gullible human intuitions, and realms that require a more seemingly exotic system of measurement or description to access. So Yes, charlatans and religious evidentialists and apologists have, of course, uh, too much and often uh, too brazenly exploited this feature of scientific process. But the answer, as Philip Pullman would, I think, con concur, is not to deny any connection between science and creative thinking. Science and creativity can be mutual boons to each other. And most scientists don't actually need to be told this. But uh, maybe the folks who balk at words like naturalist or atheist as implying a total and inhuman renunciation of subjectivity and poetry uh, might be comforted to know it. <laughs> 
So in the first book of the series, The Northern Lights or The Golden Pump Compass, uh, Sir Philip Pullman has this comparison to make about the value of imagination with respect to our reality, not just as a means of falsification and escapism, uh, when Lyra is told a revised version of the story of Adam and Eve is a quote from the book. <clears throat> Lyra asks, it ain't true, is it? Not true, like chemistry or engineering, not that kind of true. There wasn't really an Adam and Eve. The Cassington scholar told me it was just a kind of fairy tale. And the character Lord Asriel, to whom she is speaking, replies, the Cassington scholarship is traditionally given to a free thinker. It's his function to challenge the faith of the scholars. Naturally, he'd say that. But think of Adam and Eve like an imaginary number, like the square root of minus one. You can never see any concrete proof that it exists, but if you include it in your equations, you can calculate all manner of things that couldn't be imagined without it. So this also brings us to a significant point about how Pullman regards the genre of fantasy literature as a whole. He, he actually doesn't have much fondness for the category as it's popularly exercised as a vehicle for adventurism and uh, an abnegation of the real. He considers his trilogy a realistic work that happens to operate on a different or rather expanded natural system from the one to which we, the readers, are accustomed. Again, making me wonder why the possibility of having his creative metaphysics preempted by real life science should be a, of any concern to him, but I can certainly appreciate why he's moved by the thought that this notion of a consciousness particle uh, could actually correspond in some way to the not yet understood areas of our own cosmos and natural order uh, by that, that scintillating possibility and, and frequent truth that creative speculation can actually lead us to real and useful conclusions. And this idea at its best is a fundamental feature of what it means to be a full human, uh, all experience being somewhat filtered through imaginative and narrow faculties already. Um, but at its most meager, uh, this idea, this eagerness for a, a correspondence like that uh, is perhaps a consolation to those of us uh, like me who have dedicated our lives to vocations uh, like the writing of fiction or the performing of theater in my case, not widely regarded as very useful. So if Pullman sometimes appears uh, tempted to give his variation on hylozoism more than its dubious real life do, his attraction to this idea is at least somewhat based not just in narrative possibilities, though he does say he especially appreciates science as a repository of metaphor, um, but it's a real desire of his to understand the universe in natural and verifiable terms. And he, he rightly sees no reason some amount of regulative, uh, regulated imaginative thinking can't be a part of that process. So his treatment of the idea of material consciousness should be distinguished from similar ideas with a more supernatural tint, uh, vitalism, animism, etc. However, his trilogy is based on an acknowledgement of how readily the real, the, the natural physical world, which he reveres as his creative and experiential source, lends itself to the mythological and theological projections of the humans that inhabit it. So let's explore that a bit by zeroing in now on how dust, the conscious consciousness particle, functions in the trilogy. So dust both gravitates towards itself and is further indefinitely generated by its own use and self-contact, not being bound to laws of conservation. Uh, I'm reminded of a quote from Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain regarding the seemingly insoluble reflexive quality of natural consciousness. Mann writes, consciousness is just a function of matter organized into life, a function that in higher manifestations turned upon its avatar and became an effort to explore and explain the phenomenon it displayed, a hope, hopeful, hopeless project of life to achieve self-knowledge. So in Pullman's world, the cosmic genesis of this particle is not made entirely clear. In fact, this dispute forms the basis of much of the theological and philosophical division in his protagonist, Lyra's world. But he does tell us that there is a point at which dust became connected to or started interfering with biological life in evolutionary terms about 35,000 years prior to the present of our protagonists. This is when human skulls first became conscious in a way that can be compared to present day humans uh, in, in Pullman's reckoning. So before the function of dust called shadow particles by, by others is fully understood, it is known that traces of it are suddenly evident around human remains around this time, 35,000 years ago, but not just around human bodily remains, also artifacts uh, in some positive correspondence with the degree of conscious activity employed in their construction. So in other words, an untouched rock would not have shadow particle or dust activity, but a rock with a face carved into it would. <clears throat> 
uh, if it also had a runic or otherwise you know, glyphic or pictorial engraving, this would further excite shadow particle activity or dust in some recognizable upward relationship with the awareness that went into the craft. So Pullman's use of the 35,000 year old mark, as I understand it, corresponds with the oldest known figurative art of a human, the Venus of Holfels, uh, though a, a recent New York Times article talking about in our world now uh, claims the Chigurh sculpture at 12,000 years old as not just the oldest wooden sculpture, but quote, by far the earliest known work of ritual art. So uh, there, there may be some technicality uh, that a qualified anthropologist could sort out for us here. Uh, a disambiguation of figurative versus zoomorphic versus mobiliary or ritual or representational art, or it could be the times taking uh, Barnum-esque liberties for a click. But at any rate, we can understand why for the purposes of his story, Pullman chose the <clears throat> 35,000 year old mark. Uh, and this is also considerably younger than the furthest estimates of the speciation of Homo sapiens in the range of 200 to 300,000 years ago. So in this natural mythology, the self-awareness that came with dust, with shadow particles, was not an instance of new speciation, but a more qualitative change as the dust, so to speak, settled on what was already biologically human. So when Lyra finds her way into a world even more closely resembling our own by book two, she encounters scientists who are studying this particle as dark matter. They're the ones calling it shadow particle, a force which can't be seen directly, but can be observed and measured by its effect. So this distinction between the way Lyra's world studies and more importantly describes these particles and the way the scientists do so in the world more similar to ours is really significant as well. In Lyra's world, there are scholars aplenty, um, but because of the more domineering role the churchly powers play there, something we'll dig into in a bit, those who study cosmic phenomena in Lyra's world are not called scientists or physicists, but experimental theologians. They study particle metaphysics. So we see the, the constraints placed on uh, describing and discovering the workings of the universe in theological terms. It, it results in a taxonomy that can be misleading in Lyra's world that can force reality into the Procrustean bed of uh, mysticism and allegory. For example, we come to understand that the word angel in Pullman's terms is sort of a theologically loaded name for the real complex structures of pure consciousness particles. So there's wisdom and longevity and mobility that comes with being made as these beings are. Uh, but though there is a hierarchy of age, powers and constitutions among them, to think even the greatest of them approaching the perfect or even divinely descended is misguided. For without the physical basis, without the, the nerves and musculature and senses to combine with that awareness, their existence is a far more tenuous and in many ways less satisfying, less ecstatic one. Their envy for reconnection to the physical plane ends up playing a very important role when the upcoming battle against the kingdom of heaven is renewed. So Lyra encounters in, uh, we'll call it our world because it's, I, I think it's meant to suggest our world, uh, a physicist named Dr. Mary Malone, who manages to have a conversation with these shadow particles by way of a machine designed to observe them as dark matter. In the course of a conversation with these particles, Dr. Malone remembers St. Augustine saying, angel is the name of their office, not of their nature. If you seek the name of their nature, it is spirit. If you seek the name of their office, it is angel. From what they are, spirit. From what they do, angel. Well, Dr. Malone notes rightly that while Augustine was onto something formally, uh, in using the word spirit, he might be borrowing more trouble than he answers for in the distinction he attempts to draw. So she asks the shadow particles, again, the same as the dust of Lyra's world, to clarify whether they are what humans have referred to as spirit. And they reply, this variation on Augustine's theme, from what we are, spirit, from what we do, matter matter and spirit are one. So this statement is also fairly opaque at first glance, uh, but in contrast to the panpsychism of an innate consciousness in all matter, what is meant here again is that the consciousness particle is a variety of matter itself, one that can grant inert forms of matter awareness in some degree. And this lends us all those features of feeling, self-knowledge, desire, will, and alert waking interaction that can be poetically summarized with a word like spirit. The distinction then is not between the material and the immaterial, but between 
percipient matter and non. So the percipient component is itself material, but one that, as the angels demonstrate, has a more amorphous and easily disrupted structural integrity when operating on its own without a more rigid material substrate. Angels in Pullman series are highly vulnerable to atmospheric pressures and disruption. A wounded one perishes by a badly timed door opening in one chapter. So backtracking to discuss the story of the dust particle in Lyra's world and the metaphysics therein and how it segues into the next topic, Pullman's implication of the churchly powers, these agglomerated, worldly, breakating, organizational bodies, which he collectively calls the magisterium. Lyra, towards the end of book one, learns that the truth-telling instrument that has guided her on her journey, an alethiometer, more on that later, actually relies on dust to work. She asks how this is, how was dust discovered? And she's told the following. In one way, the church has always been aware of it. They've been preaching about dust for centuries, only they didn't call it by that name. But some years ago, a Muscovite called Boris Mikhailovich Rusakov discovered a new kind of elementary particle. They're called elementary particles because you can't break them down any further. There's nothing inside them but themselves. Well, this new kind of particle was elementary, all right, but it was very hard to measure because it didn't read in any of the usual ways. The hardest thing for Rusakov to understand was why the new particle seemed to cluster where human beings were as if it were attracted to us and especially to adults. Children too, but not nearly so much until their demons have taken a fixed form. During the years of puberty, they begin to attract dust more strongly and it settles on them as it settles on adults. Now, all discoveries of this sort, because they have a bearing on the doctrines of the church, have to be announced through the magisterium in Geneva. And this discovery of Rusikov's was so unlikely and strange that the inspector from the consistorial court of discipline suspected Rusikov of diabolic possession. He performed an exorcism in the laboratory. He interrogated Rusikov under the rules of the Inquisition, but finally they had to accept the fact that Rusikov wasn't lying or deceiving them. Dust really existed. That left them with the problem of deciding what it was. And given the church's nature, there was only one thing they could have chosen. The magisterium decided that dust was the physical evidence for original sin. So a version of Adam and Eve <clears throat> involving the animal familiars, the demons, is then told. So their loss of innocence in the garden, succumbing to the serpent's insidious advice, results in their ability to see their demons, which they had not before. So the story of Genesis has a few different permutations, not just in the Bible, but in Pullman's trilogy. As we go, we extend our journey into other worlds, some with more sympathetic views of the serpent, and many who have made uh, similar natural discoveries of cosmic workings that have so terrified the church. In Lyra's world, uh, what we would call uh, it's uh, what we would call the the Everettian hypothesis of many worlds is instead called the Barnard Stokes theory and here's Philip Pullman's explanation of that in his trilogy one making the theological connection the holy church teaches that there are two worlds the world of everything we can see and hear and touch and another one the spiritual world of heaven and hell Barnard and Stokes were two renegade theologians who postulated the existence of numerous other worlds like this one neither heaven nor hell but material and sinful they're there, close by, but invisible and unreachable. The Holy Church naturally disapproved of this abominable heresy, and Barnard and Stokes were silenced. But unfortunately for the magisterium, there seemed to be sound mathematical arguments for this other world theory. Okay, so there we have, without going too far into plot summary, explored the major components of the metaphysical propositions on which this series is based. So let's bring in the part that really made the fuss publicity-wise, Pullman's seething vision of organized religion taken to its dominating and doctrinal extreme. So the, the church in the heavens. Uh, Pullman would be annoyed, I think, for too much significance to be made of his personal life and or private intentions with respect to his stories, but some context I really think helps situate the conversation to follow. In one interview, Pullman has said, but I should say that my other connection to that story, the temptation and fall, is that I grew up as a Christian in the Christian tradition. It was in the 60s, right before there were really big changes in the language of the liturgy. A new English Bible, new forms of Anglican worship, well, I missed all those. The language that surrounded me in the church was the language that had been used for 400 years. I found myself very much a part of that particular history, those hymns, those words and prayers, that specific phraseology. It was my inheritance. I don't believe in it anymore, but I love churches, going into churches, listening to the language, it will never leave me. But it seems to me in the context of some of his later interviews that either he drifted even further from the church or he's speaking in ecclesiological terms, not as one who still enjoys attending services or the congregational or ritual element, uh, but the spaces of churches themselves. 
Uh, this is very common among atheists. Uh, we often enjoy the cavernous connection to antiquity and cosmic speculation that churches can hauntingly inspire and find much to appreciate and be excited by in the creative aesthetic and, and philosophical constructs of ritual and theology and then find ourselves a little irritated and stultified when confronted with its practical instances and sometimes the real beliefs that accompany them. Uh, Pullman's exploration and articulation of this very cognitive dissonance among what I've termed the imaginative natural secularists is uh, perhaps the single greatest collective uh, draw for me uh, to the series. He, he countenances the power of Christian mythos at least enough to manipulate it as the basis for his own counter narrative. So this sort of thing is often pointed to as a contradiction. You know, atheists spend a lot of time railing against something they don't believe in, but of course, atheists are perfectly capable of recognizing a fascinating abstraction and playing with it, and uh, what's more, identifying when it has perhaps strayed beyond its remit. Now onto the church as it is conceived in Lyra's world. Uh, here's a quotation from the book summarizing its history, and a good example of how Pullman exploits the many worlds hypothesis to make what use it pleases him to make of the history of our world, only to then careen off into a direction better suited to his story. Here's the passage. Ever since Pope John Calvin had moved the seat of the papacy to Geneva and set up the consistorial court of discipline, the church's power over every aspect of life had been absolute. The papacy itself had been abolished after Calvin's death, and a tangle of courts, colleges, and councils, collectively known as the magisterium, had grown up in its place. These agencies were not always united. Sometimes a bitter rivalry grew up between them. For a large part of the previous century, the most powerful had been the College of Bishops, but in recent years, the Consistorial Court of Discipline had taken its place as the most active and feared of all the church's bodies. But it was always possible for independent agencies to grow up under the protection of another part of the magisterium, and the Oblation Board was one of these. So the General Oblation Board is the shady religious body that hovers over the first part of the trilogy. So there's no papacy, but presidents of this consistorial court of discipline, the sort of police state wing of the church, are presidents for life. There are rivalries between the General Oblation Board, GOB, Consistorial Court of Discipline, the Society of the Work of the Holy Spirit, the College of Bishops, and the GOB has tried to understand, actually, to explore the nature of dust. But the president of the consistorial court says dust needs to be destroyed altogether. So far from creating a, a monolithic, monotheistic straw body, Pullman is deeply appreciative of the schematic tendencies of even the most powerfully established faith traditions. So the church's relationship to the universities is a, is a tense one, and only by something called scholastic sanctuary can the universities continue something like free inquiry from uh, which the various churchly bodies have in this story attempted to invade, subvert, or corrode. We discover later that the General Oblation Board is abducting children, attempting to, through a process called intercision, sever them from their demons, turning them into subdued, sleepwalking servants of orthodoxy. This is ostensibly to spare them the attraction of dust, uh, causing or signifying in a possible feedback loop as it does the awareness and heightened consciousness of adulthood, because this loss of innocence is observable by the increased presence of dust around a person and especially in their connection to their demon. And this means to the church leaders that dust is, as we said, the material representation of original sin. So the journey of the three books centers around Lyra's coming to understand the nature of dust, its role in the cosmos and human development, and ultimately uh, for her to come of age. In the first book, she is bound entirely in her own world, and we explore it fairly thoroughly and enjoy encounters with a civilization of armored bears, with witches. Witches are notable in part for their ability to separate from their demons without perishing, and other interesting peoples and cultures. And Lyra's journey takes her to the north, where the charged particles make more transparent and permeable the space between worlds, infinitely layered on top of each other. And it's here that the ambiguous and forceful character of Lord Asriel, who becomes the leader of this second rebellion against the kingdom of heaven, creates a bridge between worlds by exploiting the intense blast of fission energy that is released when a person and a demon become severed. So thus the worlds are bridged through a human child sacrifice. And the sacrifice is one of Lyra's dear childhood friends, Roger, uh, one she will eventually travel to the world of the dead to apologize for. And so the greatest self-appointed enemy of the church, this Lord Asriel, uses the same method that the General Oblation Board is using, uh, brutally rupturing this link between child and their demon, to inaugurate his war against the powers to which the GOB answers. The world of the dead, uh, which we, we just uh, mentioned to, to jump way ahead narratively to the third book, but to follow the, <clears throat> the theological thread, is in Pullman's conception, a prison camp. 
It's built in the subterranean deeps in what is otherwise just another material plane, um, but all conscious peoples after earthly death are kept there in perpetuity, a, a purgatorial karst wasteland at the edge of a Milton again wild abyss haunted by harpies. And these harpies recite to you your worst deeds and thoughts forever. But what makes it death is they are kept there without their demons or in those worlds where people's interior life does not manifest as, as demons, rather kept there with that part of them uh, that most begets animation, creativity, inspiration, sensation taken from them. So they're, they're as close as possible to being zombies without the total deprivation of awareness that would let them be ignorant of their sorry state. And we'll return to the world of the dead in a bit. So to round out this uh, churchly powers section, the authority, God, the first false angel who took credit for creation, in contrast inhabits a flying mountain fortress, the clouded mountain. Uh, he's retreated recently, rumor has it, to contemplate deeper mysteries and has delegated most of his interventionist work to his regent, the ancient angel Metatron, who was once Enoch, son of Jared, son of Jared uh, taker of many wives in his earthly life. And indeed, uh, some mortals, when they die, can become angels in, in this mythology when the rest of their corporal state perishes uh, if their most distilled conscious elements retain some residual identity. <clears throat> so the authorities regent Metatron is described as having limitless ambition, proud, chosen about 4,000 years ago to be regent. They've, been made plan they've made plans together. Uh, they think that conscious beings of every kind have become dangerously independent. So Metatron is going to intervene much more actively in human affairs than the authority has recently. Though they intend to secretly move the authority, the creator, the supposed creator, to a permanent citadel elsewhere and turn the mountain into an engine of war. They think the church is weak and corrupt and they think it compromises too readily. So Metatron wants to set up a permanent inquisition in every world run directly from the kingdom at the authority's behest. And his first campaign will be to destroy Azrael's Republic. So those are the, the cosmic stakes hanging over Lyra's adventure as it, as it goes forward. So yes, Lord Azrael is hoping to build a Republic of Heaven where the meeting of worlds, the, the democratic access to cosmic mystery and knowledge and human choice prevail. So we'll put a pin in that. Republic of Heaven is an important term going forward, but I, I wanna give the broader narrative a bit more shape first by addressing the titles of these books and examining next the theology and metaphysics of Pullman's universe through the artifacts around which each book roughly centers. So the book titles and their artifacts. The first book is called Golden Compass in the United States, but it was originally published in England under the title of The Northern Lights, referring to that charged porous place between worlds, the Aurora Borealis. It's commonly but mistakenly understood that uh, the alternative title, The Golden Compass, referred always to the truth-telling instrument that Lyra bears on her adventure, the alethiometer. It, it does strongly resemble a golden compass. Um, rather than pointing north, though, funnily enough, her destination in book one, it points to a series of symbols chosen from 36 symbols around its perimeter. Some animals, some objects, all carrying multiple layers and meanings, some of them more explicit, some of them more intuitive. So despite this instrument's appearance as golden compass, Pullman has been at pains to clarify that this phrase golden compass was actually another Miltonian one. He had initially suggested the golden compasses as a name for the whole series as dark materials. Um, golden compasses referring to the creator God's circle drawing instrument used to delineate his creation. Here's another, another Paradise Lost passage. Then stayed the fervid wheels, and in his hand he took the golden compasses prepared in God's eternal store to circumscribe this universe and all created things. One foot he centered, and the other turned round through the vast profundity obscure. That's Paradise Lost, book seven. Uh, but Pullman's publisher wanted to singularize it and make it the title of the first book as a reference to the alethiometer. Now, for what it's worth, I don't think Phil, uh, Philip Pullman should be so disgruntled, disgruntled at that mix-up. It just means that, like the symbols on the alethiometer, the title can carry multiple meanings. And the, the serendipity of the connection between Lyra's instrument and those of Milton's creator, I, I feel, it should be welcomed. Now, this is an instance where the publisher's instinct was not so deleterious as all that. I also like the, the symmetry Compass allows for with the other titles. Um, as each book features now a different dust interactive artifact referenced in the title. The subtle knife and the amber spyglass are the others, and we will talk about those in the order in which they appear. <clears throat> but first, the alethiometer, the golden compass. There are four needles on it, three set manually by the reader to frame the question, and then a fourth needle points in sequence to the symbols that make up its answer. 
So Lyra is capable of entering a focused trance and reading it with a sort of intuitive grace without having to study how, which is in contrast to the handful of adult scholars known for being able to decipher its messages. There are only six such, such instruments known to have been made. So the trained readers have had to commit years of study to this practice. And when Lyra comes into adulthood, she may not find reading it to be such an instinctively easy thing, uh, but the skill that comes with commitment and study rather than blithe grace uh, will also come with its own benefits and new depths. Now the alethiometer cannot predict the future, but it can speak to present truth. This particular alloy is attractive to the dust that powers it, uh, and because the dust powers it, the answers that the alethiometer returns sometimes seem to be willfully cryptic, even tendentious, beyond just the, the imprecision of the symbols. So it's after all powered by the particles of will. There, there appears to be a, a larger motive in this will that informs how it chooses to reveal or frame the truths it offers up. So even truth, as we know, can be couched in terms that suggest different interpretations. And this larger motive will involve Lyra, the second rebellion against the kingdom of heaven, and eventually a young boy from our world named Will. And that brings us to book and artifact two, the subtle knife. So in the world Lyra crosses over into the, the bridge formed by Azrael's child demon sacrifice, a world seemingly bereft of adults, Lyra encounters another boy, also not native to this other world, named Will. He's found a window from his world, which we take to be ours, into this one that seems to connect his and Lyra's. He will eventually become the bearer of something called the subtle knife, which is capable of opening windows between worlds. It also goes by the name of Esahedra, the god killer. It was fashioned by careless, greedy scholars in the Tower of Angels that looks out over this city now in disrepair. This is one of the few places in the series where Pullman seems to be suggesting that human inquiry can go too far. Uh, oftentimes in our world, nuclear age destructive capability and the disastrously corruptible connective apparatuses from Silicon Valley are seen as signs that humans should know when to stop the search for knowledge. Uh, I think this is mixing up two different human tendencies in one, that is research versus development uh, of, of the, the two often totally collocated R&D, uh, or another one, uh, science and technology, as though the former must always be bound to the latter, uh, which in popular parlance it often is. But uh, regardless, here the weapon that came about from inquisitiveness combined with acquisitiveness is the subtle knife. It's described as about eight inches long, rosewood handle, gold wires, angels on either side, and it can do a couple of things. One edge can cut any object. The other edge can open the doors between worlds. And to use it, the bearer must also kind of put their mind on the tip of the knife, go into that trans-like state, like the one with which Lyra reads the alethiometer. So it also responds to consciousness in a way. It can also kill specters, which are beings that similar to dust are attracted to adult awareness and consciousness, but it, they lack dust's self-generative quality. So instead they focus on things like terror, shame and self-doubt. And so these specters consume their victim's consciousness rather than sharpening it um, and complicating it. So uh, it's these tenuous vaporous columns that have zombified or driven out the adult population of the city in which Will and Lyra find themselves. Uh, once the knife is in their possession, doors open to other worlds of adventure. Now the third artifact of the series, and my favorite, uh, the one for which the final installment is named, is the Amber Spyglass, which is an instrument our friend Dr. Mary Malone, who we mentioned earlier, fashions. Informed by uh, the shadow particles she contacts through her own mechanical device that she is to play the serpent in Lyra's story, Dr. Malone flees her own world, ours, and finds herself in one in which the prevailing conscious species is the Mulefa, diamond-shaped framed trunked animals that have developed a symbiosis with giant oily seed pods from a tree endemic to their world. And around this, their entire civilization is based. And they use these seed pods for coming of age rituals. Uh, the equivalent for a Mulefa child of a demon ceasing to change shape is that they can ride the seed pods, which have a groove into which they can slip certain digits of their feet at the proper angle and thus create a sort of axle on which they can roll and ride these oiled seed pods using their free legs for propulsion. So these people, for the, they are people, have their own version of the Adam and Eve story, expressing here gratitude to a serpent who teaches them to have this relationship to the seed pods, representing the moment when consciousness graced them and they distinguished themselves from the other grazing beasts of their world. So this, uh, Mary's Malefa friend tells her, was not a literal event, but is a make-like, a word similar to metaphor, but that seems to much better emphasize the kind of active, projective, non-intrinsic quality of person-rendered creative associations. So our word, metaphor, etymologically refers to a transferring rather than a making of meaning. Um, 
why there is such a close correspondence between the, the Adam and Eve narratives enshrining this event, uh, this moment of awakening across worlds, we must assume has something to do with Dust's interference in life's development as it prepared its second rebellion against the kingdom of heaven. And the Malefa also have their own name for dust or shadow particles. They call it the Sraf, which sounds strangely like Seraph or angel. And as we know, angels are one, uh, one way of naming the station which the beings composed of the consciousness particle are considered by some to occupy. So this series is full of intriguing linguistic linkages like that used as a way of, of tracking the differentiation of worlds seeded from a shared source, um, a shared cosmic source, not the conscious creator. So these Mulefa, unlike the humans in Mary or Lyra's world, they can see this dust, this shadow particle, this sraf. So Mary decides she would like to see Sraf too. So using lacquer from these trees, she creates an amber lens through which she attempts to see what they see. The key ingredient turns out to be the oil from the seed pods, which by now has an extraordinary trace of conscious use from the, we can figuratively call it, spirit of mutualism that completely implicates it in Mulefa civilization and culture and innovation. And sure enough, once Mary adds this to her spyglass, she can suddenly see what they see. She can see the consciousness particle, the dust. And here's a, a slight paraphrase of how this is described in the book. It's described as gold everywhere, light drifting, floating in currents of purpose, but more so unconscious beings, not obscuring them, but somehow making them clearer. The light is thicker and more full of movement on conscious beings. And around the little ones too, also around shelters and nets and fishing fires, um, the light around the little one playing and expressing curiosity in the world is stronger than around the idle children, though not by much. It shows intention as these swirling, eddying, drifting about, breaking off, reforming as, as, as new thoughts are born, currents of intention. So around the mother, it has a different effect, stronger gold particles, more settled, more powerful currents. She's preparing food and watching her child at the same time. And the dust around her gives an impression of responsibility and wise care is how Pullman describes it. So just, just try to imagine for a moment what that must look like. What does responsibility and wise care look like when converted to this image of currents of golden particles? And when I was a young boy reading this series, naturally the subtle knife, the weapon with which I could fight and move between worlds was the most exciting of the three artifacts. In my college years, I would have given anything for the alethiometer, responding to the need to know, to understand, to reduce things to unassailable truths, to interpret and translate other people's actions and meanings and, and to use that understanding for my advantage. But at my current age, I would choose the amber spyglass from among the three person manufactured artifacts for interacting with dust if I were to be steward of any of them. I, I really I love the idea that we're all just walking in our own swirling corpuscular columns of creative intention. And I often regard people in my life, whether close to me or, or strangers, in terms of how their sraf activity might look or behave if their inner life was exogenously automatically materialized in this way. Uh, but in our world, uh, alas, we have to make do with other signals to see the qualities the sraf represents, our bearings, expressions, our choices, our words, relationships, and our art. Um, Mary also notices Dr. Malone looking through her amber spyglass from the treetops that the dust is leaking out of this world. A prophecy involving Lyra is supposed to resolve this catastrophe before consciousness and intention is fully drained from the many worlds. <clears throat> All right, we're coming up on the final couple of sections here. Uh, let's talk about God briefly, uh, even though we're running out of time. Uh, Pullman is one of the world's famous atheists. So, All right, we'll touch briefly on how God his, and his conception of this false authority features in this series. Uh, the children do, spoilers again, I, I really meant it, uh, the children do in a manner of speaking kill him, but it is an inadvertent act of compassion. For by the time they encounter him, he is ancient beyond sense, beyond real identity and awareness, a relic of the grandiosity and profundity of which he once tried to be representative, though he was never really the creator, but one who claimed the title. This is really important. Atheism in most cases is not a statement about the content of the cosmos, but about its station from what we do versus what we are. Right, so let's, let's say this false authority was responsible for creation. Now, it, Pullman, I think, implicitly asks, would even that entitle him to tyrannical control of the universe? So to reject God then is to reject a, a human conceived office for the content of the universe, whatever that content may or may not be, whatever we may already know or have yet to find out. And in Pullman's world, there is an authority, an object of the world's devotion, a, a powerful cosmic being. 
He is not the creator, but he exists in this mythology, the creator or not. However powerful and splendiferous, can he command involuntary, not just practical obedience, but worship, true worship? Never. That's the atheism I read in Pullman's work. That's the atheism to which I subscribe. Do the children find him, the authority, in the crystal container in which he is being transported away from the final series of battles between Azrael's forces and the authorities and Metatron's? So his relocation party has been ambushed. He's trapped earthbound in his crystal cell. The children, not knowing him on encounter, except as an imprisoned and decrepit angel, thinking to save him, open it. And so his feeble particles of now seemingly static, no longer productive or scintillating angel consciousness crumble and drift apart when they meet the air like an old uncovered parchment, granting him at last a tenuous myth maker and representative of his own legend extended beyond use, the relief of being dispersed into the cosmos from which he first emerged. So now, before we come to the final section, I want to uh, briefly note uh, that this topic of his dark materials and theology could fill several long classes of this sort. Uh, there are a number of religious connections I'm forced to elide for purposes of time, including a variety of pagan and folkloric traditions, uh, Zoroastrianism, and of course, uh, many more connections that could be made to the works of Blake and Milton. Uh, I want to wrap this up, though, by talking about the relationship between imagination and truth, the active and positive complement to the books, atheism and irreligiousness. So imagination and truth. Uh, Pullman's advocacy of imagination and his treatment of imagination as something more interesting than just a means to shut out reality or create alternative reality is to me a contribution more significant to the theological conversation, uh, even than his excoriation of the corruptibility of religion of which we're all aware. Um, though of course the two topics are connected. Uh, if we can find a way as humans to derive imaginative satisfaction in life, given the full exercise of imagination and all it can be, while identifying those parts that are in fact imaginative as imaginative, our species just might have a fighting chance. I really believe that. Uh, to use Pullman's phrase, I don't argue it, I perceive it. Uh, as, we, uh, as I'll get into in a little bit, uh, this, is, this is also the area, the uses of imagination, and here's sort of the critical uh, wrap up, in which Pullman can be a little inconsistent, uh, especially factoring in his more recent trilogy. So Pullman describes Lyra despite her penchant for lying and games of make-believe as not being an especially imaginative child. And uh, that is actually an asset to her, both in her mendacity and in her reading of the alethiometer, the truth instrument. So her greatest skills are lying and interpreting the truth instrument. The overly imaginative people are not good at reading the alethiometer. They tend to read too much into the symbols just as their lies are often too extravagant to be plausible. So Pullman's description of Lyra as unimaginative is somewhat challenged by the, the current trilogy he's working on that in part explores Lyra's college years. I'll try not to get into that too much. Um, there's so many elements in the series I can't include here for purposes of time. But suffice to say, uh, fantasy and science fiction are very risky mediums for making an explicit appeal to the imagination because of course, the whole thing is a product of the imagination of the authors and the readers. Um, but to the characters in the story, it constitutes their reality. So. And to briefly use my favorite example from another work of easily muddled lines between, um, or my favorite example of how complicated these lines between metaphor, fantasy, illusion can be when they pile up uh, and how these terms change depending on the relationship to the readers versus the characters. Um, Macbeth's dagger may be a thematically salient metaphor. That doesn't mean he doesn't literally see it. And just literally seeing it in turn doesn't mean that it is materially there with him. And it's not being materially there could have at least two explanations, a ghostly or otherwise supernatural apparition or a hallucinatory vision, as he says, proceeding from the heat oppressed brain. To top it off, once deciding what is in the text, the director must then decide how to handle the expression and the visual and for the actor tactile medium of the theater. That's the great sublimity of that craft. But whatever the medium, it is infuriatingly easy for fantasy storytellers to abuse the potential for confusion in this territory by breaking their own rules and to then resort to uh, things like, well, some things aren't meant to be explained as though you know, paradox weren't not only somehow difficult to come by, or as if paradox were, were difficult to come by and also increased in meaningless, meaningfulness, the more uh, kind of confounding its terms. Of course, there are some things that don't lend themselves to explanation, but perhaps establishing a standard uh, that must be met before this can be invoked uh, will we'll spare us confusion when talking about metaphor grafted into fantasy stories. Um, in the first trilogy, I'm pleased to say 
Sir Philip, for the most part, avoids these traps. Um, but we'll, we'll examine in a moment a couple of examples uh, where maybe he, maybe he doesn't quite. I have to skip some stuff just for purposes of time. Uh, but he invokes the, um, the art historian and scholar of symbols, Ernst Gombrich. Uh, he quotes him in an essay, Pullman quotes him in an essay saying, our language favors this twilight region between the literal and the metaphorical. Who can always tell where one begins and the other ends? And most people understand generally what this is getting at. Um, but we can also usually determine with a fair level of confidence where that line is if we do a close reading. But this isn't the same thing as needing to determine what every piece of poetry objectively means, but rather the degree to which it is susceptible to explicit interpretation. And the same goes for the sliding scale along which it is helpful or unhelpful to implicate the writer's intention. So uh, gauging these difficult lines, mapping out the difference between uh, abstraction and objectivity, um, the fact that we can make objective statements about subjective experience, all of that is very much implicit in his dark materials as a trilogy at its best. Okay, coming up on the very, very last bit now, um, how imagination directly and I think beautifully functions in this narrative as a pathway to truth, um, though through the eschatological lens of Pullman's mythos. So Lyra goes to the world of the dead to find her friend Roger and apologize for inadvertently leading him into Azrael's clutches. But in the course of this adventure, she ends up helping to free its captives. She can only reach the world of the dead by the painful and sickening abandonment of her demon Pantalaimon before the ferryman, a Karanusk elder who has ferried innumerable dead for millennia will take her on board. And after a harrowing journey uh, to and within the world of the dead, Lyra tells its foul wardens, the harpies, true stories from her life which encourages them to allow those trapped in the land of the dead to go out into the open air where well, those tenuous particle connections retaining some blurry semblance of their worldly shape can dissipate, not into oblivion, but back into the cycle of life and being. At first, Lyra tries to make stories up about her life and adventures, but they know she's lying. They're furious and attack her, but telling them true stories from her life gives the harpies vicarious pleasure in the sensory real. And that is the fare for passage out of the land of the dead and into the open air. This means that we are incentivized not to live according to a rigid set of commandments, but to live life richly, to, to err, to be challenged, to feel, to learn, and most of all, to form memories, which make up our personalities. So there is creativity and imagination in the act of sharing these true things in the form of experience and the art of relating stories. It's not just making stuff up to use our imagination. So this life right now is the life that counts. It's, it's the one we can be sure of. So imagination in, that, in this light is not just fabrication, it's implicated in recall and the honest and moving transmission of truth and wisdom and ideas to other people, encouraging them to live fully too. It's a way of seeing, a way of expression, Pullman says. It's, it's not just make-believe, not that make-believe doesn't have its place so long as we honor it as make-believe rather than as a way to mislead people or as a substitution for a reality by which we have the misfortune to be discouraged. So imagination is the driving force of complication and analogy and abstract meaning and qualitative value and yes sometimes escapism and consolation but in all uses is the best way to get the most out of the material world which far from being imagination's terminus and constrainer is its sensory and creative wellspring so in conclusion tie this all together um, ultimately lyra and will two children from different worlds facilitated by dr mary malone their serpent they will fall for each other as part of their transition into adulthood this reenactment of the fall, this time though as a triumph of awareness and bodily sensation across worlds, helped by the recycling of dust through the release of those trapped in limbo, stops the leakage of the consciousness from the earthly planes and into the annihilating abysses of the world of the dead. So the great taboo against touching someone else's demon is here waived by Will and Lyra as they enter adulthood in a mingling of bodies and souls, which are one and the same matter as poets such as Blake and Walt Whitman have both suggested in their own terms. And as Lyra and, and Will's demons mingle and, and they break the taboo of touching one another's demon, I, I'm reminded of John Donne's The Ecstasy. As twixt two equal armies, fate suspends uncertain victory, our souls, which to advance their state, were gone out, hung twixt her and me. So this riddling passage of devotional metaphysical poetry, suddenly with Pullman's device of the demons, the animal spirits, it makes perfect sense. It's given an explicit application in Will and Lyra's love. It's one delightful, real application of the non-real, of fantasy realism. But the Republic of Heaven that Lord Asriel hopes to build across the worlds and for eternity, it turns out cannot be. 
because some property of life confines it to its native world and place. It can travel and spend time in other worlds as, as Lyra and Will did, but eventually this will vitiate and wear down the visitor. So there cannot really be a material Congress across worlds. And eternity, as we saw in the despairing, unforgiving gray of the world of the dead, turns out to be a punishing sentence, far from a blessed cure for mortality. So therefore, the Republic of Heaven has to be here and now, in this life. And what's more, every time the subtle knife is used, one of the consciousness-devouring specters is created. The tearing of the fabric, fabric between worlds also creates an opening through which dust can leak out, not from one world to another, but out of terrene existence altogether. So this is the source of great sadness and the point of conclusive triumph for the series, as Will and Lyra, having just discovered their love, have to be parted. Imagination then becomes a very real way for them to stay connected, not through psychic dialogues or magic mirrors. It isn't enchantment, it isn't make-believe. They know the other is there, living a hopefully full life in the overlapping but now permanently inaccessible parallel world. They have enough deep understanding of each other to be able to really continue to envision the other without seeing them through memory, experience, educated speculation, and the electrifying, animating inspiration of love. So the trace that this leaves, the conscious integrated effect of our relationships, our ideas, our experiences, though maintained by the imagination, can be lived, can exude from us. Like dust, the imagination is a physical record. Nature more than accommodates it. Nature feeds it, gives rise to it. So the imagination as imagination is an actual functional reality that we can learn to use to compensate for spatial distance and to find meaning. So only by honoring this intention, interaction, engagement, the creative process, and imagination of something, uh, the imagination is something that is real, something that can give back to the real by enhancing our relationship with it. Through that, we can hope to build what Philip Pullman calls the Republic of Heaven. That's really uh, all we have time for. Thank you all for coming. Uh, happily, this, uh, this has been recorded. So if you thought any of it was worth hearing but didn't quite digest it in one go, you can look for it to be posted within a couple of days on Facebook and YouTube for rewatching at your convenience. Uh, thank you all for coming. I will uh, halt the recording and open the floor for questions. Thank you all so much. <laughs>